Hey, good morning, church family. How are we today? Look, so we're going to take communion. Pablo already preached for us. He shared his entire heart. But just know that Pablo and I have been friends for years now, and everything he shared is absolutely true. Everything he shared that he has seen in this church family, a vibrancy and a hunger for the Lord, and we all should take stock of that. To know that somebody that's come on mission has seen people already on mission and said, I want to be a part. And so that's just kudos to you guys. And we're excited for 2023 because I believe, our team believes, we believe that God has great things in store for us as we surrender our lives to him. Right? He's got great things in store for us as we surrender our lives to him. So at first it's like, oh, celebrate that. We want the good things. Surrender my life. I promise you. There is life on the other side of surrender. And we got to sing about that this morning. We're going to see a baptism that's going to exemplify that. And we're going to talk through our 14th week of quest today around what it looks like to actually live a life for Jesus. So if you're tuning in online, we're glad you're with us today. If you're a guest with us joining us because it's your New Year's resolution to come to church in 2023, congratulations, day one, check. Glad you're here. We'll see you on week 51 in December. Right, but ultimately we, we've got to hold this. I just feel like I got to encourage us all. Let's hold these resolutions with open hands because we got to look back and recognize 2021, 2020, 2022 even didn't come good on its promises. So let's just hold everything in light hands. Who knows what's going to happen on Monday, right? So let's just consider ourselves just so blessed to have today together because we don't know. We've learned, right? You can clap for that. We've learned that we aren't promised tomorrow. We've learned that we can't control our lives as much as we think we can, but there is one on the throne. There's one on the throne. There's one that wants to visit us and dwell within us. And his Holy Spirit wants to empower us. And that is why we're gathered today. And quite frankly, I was expecting maybe 200 people today. I thought all of y'all would have seen the ball drop last night, set your alarms back. Oh, isn't it daylight savings or something? And I'm not going to be able to make it in today. And we're going to have a jammed out 11 o'clock. But to see everybody here desiring to worship God at 9 a.m to come to church and worship and give him the glory is just so encouraging for my heart. And so we're going to step right into week 14 with Quest, if this table stays up. Um, but I want to invite you all, everybody in this room, to a big thing that we're having coming up in January, coming up on the 23rd, which is a Monday night at 6 p.m., is our next partner night. And so some of, you here were, some of you here were with us in August when we had our first partner night. And we want to invite you all to the next series of the partner night where we're talking about what it means to partner with Jesus first and then his church here at East Point. One of his churches here in Greater Portland. And what that means for us in our lives. And it's a good time at the beginning of the year to say, what are those rhythms in my life that God would want me to include so I can live a life more useful for his purposes? You see, we don't have membership. We don't have members. We don't have people who have signed in and, and necessarily vote for the church congregation. We have partners who vote with their hands and their feet. We have people who say, I'm going to live a life in pursuit of Jesus alongside this church family in mission. And that is what we'll be talking about Monday at 6 p.m. So it's going to be right here in the main auditorium. We'll have an RSVP process so we can roughly know how many people will be attending. And it's going to be here and we're going to have more promotion coming out in the weeks to come. So mark your calendars tentatively for, for January 23rd at 6 p.m. right here in the main auditorium. We'd love to have you for partner night. And I have to apologize before we get into the 14th week. I've personally loved Quest 52, but I've had a really hard time with these sermon titles. Who are social influencers for Jesus? Part one. Who are social influencers for Jesus? Part two. How do I know if I'm in Jesus' inner circle? Did Jesus know he was God when he was a boy? These titles have been really hard for me to swallow, but I've trusted. I've trusted the quest. 
And this, of course, is not the scripture, but this has been a great guide for me personally, and I hope for you all to be able to journey through this quest of who is Jesus and what does his life have for implications on mine. And yet today, I'm so glad the title is what it is for January 1st, 2023. This is the title. Are you ready for it? I don't think you're ready for it. Don't put the slide up. Are you ready for the title? Okay. Is Christianity boring? Okay, answer? No. no, okay, great. Because sometimes I'll say, yeah, it really is. <laughs> Christianity as I've known it can be pretty boring, right? I grew up in the church where I'm, I'm grateful they had seats like these. I had buddies who sat in pews and they didn't even have cushions, <laughs> right? They had somebody come up and read the liturgy, the, the word for the day out of the scriptures and it was like the first time they had read the scripture. They're mispronouncing all these names, all these towns, and then there's these long, winded sermons. And you're sitting there going, yeah, Keenan, we know. <laughs> and then the stand up, sit down, shake the hand, shake the hand, head to the fellowship hall, have a bad cup of coffee and maybe some cheese and crackers and call it a Sunday. Anybody ever been through that? And the best part is you get to do it all over again in six days. That was the church that I grew up in, and they're great people. I love them. I'm sure they're tuning in. I'm sorry. But <laughs> we, we sometimes get caught in these routines where we think, hey, we're Christians, and we just got to do the Christian thing because it's the right thing. It's because mom and dad want us to do this. Grandma and grandpa are like, are you at least getting to church for Easter? Like, we want and we feel obligated to do this Christian thing. But Why? Why would we do all of these rhythms if we never choose to follow Jesus? Because then we're just a part of a really spiritual rotary club. Doing really good things, really great works in the community, inspiring people to better lives with five-point sermons. And yet there isn't the conviction that leads us to repentance, which leads to forgiveness, which leads to freedom. That is the life of following Jesus. And there's so many in this room and I can, I can point them out where they go, oh, no, no, no. No, Christianity has not been boring for me, Kenan. I was rescued. I was rescued out of my physical brokenness and bondage or I was rescued to a new life. I was restored. My marriage was saved. My addiction is gone. My life is new. And that is the invitation that we have. When we ask, is Christianity boring? We look back on our experiences and some of us go, it has been. And others say, absolutely not. I've been in the presence of God where he's visited me. He's invested his spirit into my life. And I've been in these long drawn out moments where I've just felt the father's presence and his love washing me over. I've been there too. But today I'm hungry for more. How about you? Are we hungry for God's presence? Do we desire him to visit us? Do we desire to not live boring Christian lives, but lives in pursuit of Jesus? And if you're a guest today, buckle up. <laughs> we're glad you're with us, but we're going on a journey today to see maybe where we went wrong as the church and where Jesus invites us back into new life. So we're going to start in the book of Acts where we see one of the most beautiful pictures of the early church. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, this is what is recorded. This is the early church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And you wonder where we get the construct of how we do things on Sunday morning. The apostles' teaching, the word of God being proclaimed, is central to their gathering. Fellowship, where we're able to see each other and say, hey, we're a body. We get to know each other. We get to be plugged in and connected to breaking of bread. You wonder why we take communion every week. This is what we see in the early church, that they're breaking bread together, that they're honoring Jesus and to prayer. And we're gonna, get, we're gonna touch on prayer a little bit later, but this is the central aspect of their gathering. And unfortunately, they didn't have really cool lights, haze, and a great worship band. But how many of us would be content just gathering to hear the word proclaimed, to see each other, to take communion and to pray together? How many of us would be good with that? Okay, so new, we're going to have a budget cut going into 2023. 
I'm just I'm kidding. In verse 43, this is the result of these gatherings and what Jesus has done by his spirit. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And guess what? The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Sounds like a pretty great group of people to be a part of, does it not? And sometimes we look at our situations and we go, man, we've had tastes and glimpse of that. I want more. And I think God is going to honor our hunger as we lean in. And it talks about generosity and hospitality and signs and wonders happening amongst them. God was pleased to dwell with his church. God was pleased to empower his church. And today, I pray that God is pleased to dwell among his church today. That's my prayer. And maybe you and I, we collectively have a little work to do. Because it's been years and years and years since God's spirit broke out on Pentecost, resulting in these believers just recognizing they were made to worship God and enjoy him forever. And they completely abandoned everything. And many people, they called them Christians, little Christs. But you know what they called themselves? The way. The way. Because ultimately, They knew the way, the truth, and the life, and his name was Jesus. And he had taught them for three years, at least the apostles and the disciples, and they knew which way to take. There was no mistaking what had happened. And so just know that this radical community was not a result of good upbringing, a moral education system, or good national policy. It might be a newsflash. This was not something they manufactured, constructed, or forced to happen within their family or their community or their society. This was a movement that was birthed out of the Holy Spirit coming upon them. All of these things that we see, the devotion to the teaching, the praying, the breaking of bread, the gathering, the hospitality, the generosity was all a result of God's presence being with his people. It was fruit that bears. And sometimes we get caught in this act of trying to strive and just do it out of obligation. As Graham shared this morning, what we gave out of a heart of generosity is no small thing. It was over three quarters of a million dollars in five weeks. That is generosity that we can clap for and celebrate and we can be joyful about it. Now, some of you are saying, well, I could have used, I see my tax returns. I could use a little bit of that back. But ultimately, We give back to God out of a posture of joy because of what he's given to us and his son Jesus that he was joyful for. And so when we see outbursts of generosity or we we see people gathering in homes and hospitality, having meals together, people who never would be be together other than the church in their faith. These are good signs of the church. And I think God wants to see more and more of this birthed in us. And within a few hundred years of the early church being birthed, it had not only endured the gravest of violence and torture, but it had thrived to a point that one of the most powerful empires in the world was being transformed year after year by the church. Rome was a pagan empire full of gods, full of promiscuity, full of everything that you could want and you could have it your way. And yet the church... Initially, just a few hundred people turned into thousands over the first few years, turned into tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and birthed its way into one of the most powerful, powerful empires. And it turned it on its head. But it wasn't through the means and methods that you and I would probably employ today. It wasn't through force. It wasn't through strategy or logistics, policy. It was through the way they lived and the way they died. That was what, how the church was so powerful and potent by the way they lived and died. And then Jesus taught in Matthew 16, he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me 
will find it. They took his words seriously. They took him to the point that they knew it was a matter of life or death, but it didn't matter. They had met the risen Savior. They had met the one who defeated sin, death, and hell himself. And they were completely abandoned to this world. And tens and hundreds and mi- tens and hundreds of thousands and millions of people, billions of people today, follow Jesus as a result of their faithfulness. Because they're empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we see in the, the book of, of Acts, I want to highlight these two things. A radical prayer life a radical generosity and a radical hospitality. Imagine these Venn diagrams of life overlapping each other when people are just radically given over to prayer. And not prayer where we're drawing up our sheets and our lists and we have our checklist to go down before God. No, where we're soaking in His presence, where we're getting away and we're getting quiet with ourselves and we're listening for His voice and we're speaking to our Father. They devote themselves to prayer and out of it comes hearts of generosity and hospitality. Opening up both their home and their accounts to say, God, whatever you would want to do, do it for your name and your glory. Not out of obligation, not out of arm twisting. I'm sure they didn't have a campaign going on where they're saying, hey, if we just raise this much money, 10% is going to go to this, this nonprofit. They were bringing possessions, fields, proceeds from sales, just at the apostles' feet and saying, this is a response of what we've seen. And I think for us as a church in this next year, it's going to be so imperative that we lean into these three areas of prayer, hospitality, and generosity. That Greater Portland doesn't only feel the impact of a generous and hospitable church, they can't ignore it. They can't ignore that there's thousands of people who claim Jesus is Lord, living on mission as a part of East Point, as one of the churches here, that are radically hospitable. Opening their home. Come on in. Have a meal. Our house is a mess. Ashley and I got to get good at making like sloppy joes or something. Our whole house is a mess, but we just want people to come and enjoy and linger in presence. And then whenever God calls us to be generous, we want to be financially able to do so. And as a church, that's a call for us. Are we available to be hospitable and generous? And if anything, to pray. Are we able to pray? Because the way that this early church lived in three major classes, sometimes they break them down into five classes, but I've summed them up into these three major classes that was completely revolutionary to Roman culture and even Judeo culture. That this church that was birthed was living in a way that was so different from everything else around it that people couldn't ignore it. And they had to ask, why are you living this way? What are you doing? The Holy Spirit worked in and through this church to convict the world of its sin so they would come to know who Jesus is. And the three three categories are are socioeconomic classes, women and sexuality, I'll tie those together because unfortunately they were very tied together in this culture. And then human life. So socioeconomic classes, women and sexuality, and human life. And I'm going to read down through here. So the socioeconomic classes. In those days across the region, racial and economic classes were very strong. Depending on your family lineage or our family lineage, our nationality or our past, our social or economic status was a life sentence. Very rarely could you get out of the ruts that you were born into. It was not a land of opportunity. It was not a land of prosperity. You were stuck based on where you were born. And most likely, till the day you die. Gathering, dining, or mingling across social lines or classes was completely unheard of, especially stepping down a class. If you were of some sort of elite status, to dine with anybody below you would have been a complete cultural atrocity. Yet the early church was the most diverse community society had ever seen to this point. The church was the most diverse community that the world had ever seen. You had elite businessmen dining with previous imprisoned people. You had prostitutes coming out of a ravaged world of shame and addiction, stepping into a living room and a dining room of a whole family. You had all of these people colliding and clashing in living rooms and in marketplaces and in the temple to worship, and it was completely countercultural. 
And today I can smile because I look around this room and are we not just a beautiful, diverse expression of God's kingdom here? Do we not see people from every tribe, nation, race, color, tongue? Everybody across the spectrum is able to come equal, not only at the foot of the cross, but under the kingdom of God. And that is what the early church was. And it was radical. It was radical to the point that it was attractive. It was an attractive community to be a part of. And when it came to women and sexuality, in those days, it was cruel to be a woman. In most avenues, unless you were of royalty or high status, it was cruel to be a woman. And women were really held onto for childbearing and making the home. Sounds antiquated, right? It was worse. Men, husbands specifically, had no real bounds to their spouse. They could choose and be promiscuous and, 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 and I won't even go there, with anybody and everybody they want. Men, women, they could go out and indulge in their pleasures and come back to their wife and expect her to be completely faithful. And it was the church. It was the church that took hold of the new, what we call Christian sex ethic, where the church held high this idea of one man, one woman for life. And it wasn't out of a place of piety. It wasn't out of a place of saying, this is, we're better because we love Jesus. No, they knew the covenant that Jesus had made with them by his death and his resurrection. And they were going to apply that covenant to their spouse. Because what a model that Jesus showed for what marriage and life and flourishing looked like. And the church was completely radical. They'd get made fun of. They were called little Christs because they were these little holy, pious people. But ultimately, they lived lives that were flourishing and thriving. And so the early church lived into Jesus' sex ethic to be able to say, I am preserving myself until marriage because Jesus, you preserved me so that you could redeem me in covenant. And it was no different in their lives. And all these people that had walked from the culture, there's people with all the baggage, all the shame, all of these things saying, Does it, but, but Jesus, can you really forgive me? Can you really help me wash clean? Just like we see today. And he says, absolutely. Absolutely. Now go and sin no more. Walk into freedom. The freedom that he has for us and he had for them. And finally, as hard as it is, this was one of the most potent realities of the early church. And it was how much they valued human life. Not only living, breathing, adult human life when it came to war and punishment, but human life when it came to little ones. You see, in Roman culture, if, if there was a baby that was, that was birthed out of incest or unwanted or, or was, was just not something that was going to be convenient for them or it was, it was a result of, of tragedy, that baby, best case, was put in the marketplace to be picked up as a slave. Worst case, bear yourselves, was to be put in a garbage dump to be left for dead. Day-old children. And yet it was the Christians that picked up those little babies and not only advocated for them, but took them in as their own. It was the church that said, I know that these little ones have been knit in their mother's womb before they ever took a breath. And they're God's. And they took them in. And they loved on them. And today, it's really easy for us to separate ourselves and advocate for these very things, right? We can advocate, we can help campaign and fundraise, but isn't it so different when you say, you're welcome in my home? I'm going to really pay the price. I'm going to lay my life down so that this little one has a choice. And there are people in this room that have fostered and adopted, and you all are heroes, you all are heroes because you're giving these kiddos a second chance. And the early church was radical because they did the same thing for these little babies. Saved them from slavery, saved them from death so that they might have a life to be redeemed in Christ Jesus. This was the early church and it was absolutely radical because the followers of Jesus, this is my first point. I know I'm way in with the first point. This is my first point, that the early church, the followers of Jesus, were both potent and powerful. Potent 
and powerful. And I chose those words not because of the alliteration. Don't chuck me up as one of those guys. Potent. Because they were so concentrated in their efforts and their lives that you, you couldn't even be in their presence without taking notice. And powerful because it was well beyond anything they could muster up on their own strength. Has anybody ever choked, tried to choke down a glass of salt water? Just me? It's part of my maritime upbringing, I guess. Just imagine the saltiest glass of water that as you touch your lips, your whole face purses because you can't choke that down. So how do you dilute it? One drop of distilled water at a time. And you can drop, 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 drop until that water eventually no longer tastes so salty. But when it's so salty, you can't ignore it. And Jesus' words are so practical for Ma- in Matthew 5, where he looked at his disciples. He pointed to his disciples. He said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Imagine the early church if it had lost its saltiness. Imagine if it had just wandered away and been diluted by the Roman culture, and a good portion of it was. And a good portion of the church today is diluted by the culture, losing its saltiness, losing the very edge of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, leading lives of surrender to lay our lives down for Him. If we lose our saltiness as a church, we might as well just be trampled underfoot. And power, they were marked with power, Holy Spirit power. Again, they weren't, it wasn't because of their elected status, their control on culture, or their ability to articulate and argue their points. It was simply because the power of God decided to dwell among them through the Holy Spirit. That he did the works. He did the conviction. He did the drawing. And the church was just willing to be the vessel. They were powerful, not by their own strength, but by their willingness to follow the ways of Jesus, to truly be marked as followers of Jesus, followers of the way, and not just a church, not just an organization, not just a gathering. They said, we have a life to live, and it's to be lived for him and him alone. So we ask, what happened? Right? We see the expressions of it happen in our gathering, but we can see all sorts of churches that have all of these issues, and we're no different. We're just a group of sinners saved by grace, gathered in here, and I'm the chief sinner. And yet God still wants to work with his power and potency through us. So what happened? Well, I believe, personally, looking through the history, that Christians finally realized that they could grab a seat at the table with the cultures of the world. And they'd, uh, they'd embrace all of the allure of control and they'd be willing to compromise on their convictions. They wanted to take up control like every other culture, control people, control finances, control structure and status and compromise on the very things Jesus gives us so that we can maintain that control. Because the ways of the world, the ways of the world that we live in today in 2023, out there, Control and compromise. As long as we have control, we're in power. And we'll compromise whatever it takes to maintain control. It's pretty scary, isn't it? And you know what's even scarier? Is when it lives inside of you. Because I know, if I'm not seeking his face, if I'm not seeking his presence, man, my desire to control grows and grows and grows. And I'm willing to compromise to maintain that control. That's a scary place to be. Anyone ever been there? You don't have to clap. (laughs) But what's the antidote? What's the antidote? What brings the potency and brings the power back? It's his presence. It's his presence. We need to seek his face. We need to see who he truly is. Our Father desires to love us and love us deeply. And when we come into His love, when we are able to fully worship Him and abandon the world, our desire to control goes down and our willingness to compromise starts receding. And we're willing to be the potent, powerful community of followers of Jesus that He intended us to be. You see, Jesus says in in Matthew 20, He brings the disciples together and he says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them 
And the high officials exercise authority over them. Sounds familiar today, right? The officials, the elected ones, or the lords, they're just going to keep working their power and controlling our lives. And Jesus looks at them and says, but not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And for us, as we look back, Christianity, no different than Israel, has rebelled and rebelled time and time again against this very teaching that Jesus had. That we're meant to be servants and slaves of other people for the glory of his name. We're meant to serve people. We're meant to lay our lives down for others. And yet, man, maintaining control and compromising feels awful good sometimes. And again, it's his presence that draws us in. It's the power of his Holy Spirit and the potency of Jesus' teachings that he revives his church over and over again. And it's through faithful, small remnants within the church. And I believe for us that Jesus is inviting us into something today, the first of the year in 2023, that he's asking us to be a remnant of his followers that are willing to consecrate themselves for his name. And some people say that's a lot of big religious words. A remnant, small group of people willing to leave what they've known in pursuit of something greater and to consecrate ourselves, to set ourselves apart, to be used for greater works. He's inviting us to go on a journey with him to truly understand what it means to engage his presence more and more, to understand who he is as our father who loves us and to embrace him and be willing to walk away from anything and everything in our lives. Because he says, as we seek first his kingdom, everything else will be added unto us. Anything that's good for us, anything that helps us thrive, he'll add it back. We just have to seek his kingdom. And so this is the word that I feel like Jesus has for us today. When we look at is Christianity boring or is following Jesus exciting? All of these things hinge on this invitation that Jesus has for us today. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. And how many of us want to find that road to life? And we can look at this and say, this is, just, this is just a beautiful picture of the gospel. Jesus paved the way so that we could live this life where we've found the road that leads to life because we've been saved in his name. I think Jesus is speaking a little more directly here to his disciples and his church, knowing what was to come. That daily, we have to enter through the narrow gate. And that's not the turnstiles at Disney World where it's one person at a time, you know, and it ticks and counts you. This narrow gate in the Greek is crushing. It's tight. It's hard to get through. It's painful. Why? Because Jesus says, you've got to lose your life for my sake. That's the invitation he has for us. And he goes on to say that the, the road that leads to life, it's narrow. Only a few find it. And the ESV says that the road that leads to life is difficult and hard. Happy New Year's. But this life that he has for us is the greatest gift we could ever experience. Because as the church held on to the power and the potency that came from the Spirit of God, that came from the gospel, they were willing to leave everything and anything to find that way that leads to life. And are we going to be the few that find it as a church? Because for me, that's my resolution. My resolution is to enter the narrow gate. My resolution is to commit myself to Jesus, to seek first his kingdom, to lay my life down so that he can raise me from the dead, that I'm willing to die on January 1st, 2023, so that he can bring new life in me. Because I'm tired of myself. Anybody else tired of themselves, especially the 2020 version, the 2021 version, the 2022 version? Again, just me? I want to experience his presence more. I want to know who my father is in a deeper way. I want to know him in the same way that Jesus says I can know him. 
I want to experience the love that he has that says it's lavished upon me. And how about you? Do you want the same? Or do we want to just keep going down the broad road that inevitably leads to destruction? Full of control and compromise. Let's keep ourselves comfortable. Keep our capacity pretty filled up with our schedules and our time. And keep ourselves committed so we only have this much left for God. And Jesus says, no, you need to die to yourself so I can use you. I want to fill you up beyond measure. And are we willing to make capacity for his presence in our life? And John the Baptist in John chapter 3 verse 30 is the essence of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. It says he must become greater and I must become less. In order for him to become greater, we must become less. They're not exclusive of each other. If he just becomes greater, I'll be less. No, we must become less so he can become greater. That's my commitment. That's my resolution. And I'm going to step into this year full of steam. And I'm going to fall flat on my face probably this week. And my gracious Savior is going to pick me back up. He's going to set me back on my feet. He's going to say, keep going. Keep going. Enter through the narrow gate. Walk that difficult road because Kenan, it leads to life. Church, the road he has for us leads to life. And are we willing to walk it? Are we willing to live lives of potency and power by his Holy Spirit, laying our lives down, not as just to pick them up later, but lay them on the altar? To say we're willing to die to ourselves so that we can be raised to new life in Jesus. And you ask, what might that look like for me? What might that actually look like for me stepping into 2023? Here's the picture that I'm going to leave you with. This is the picture that I just imagine this is where Jesus wants us. In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, they'll put it up on the screen. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Jesus went to be with his father. Jesus knew that he was the beloved son, that the father was well pleased with him. And if we stand here accepting that Jesus is Lord, have repented from our lives, have been forgiven by his grace, we too stand with Jesus as co-heirs where the father says, with you I'm well pleased. But he's inviting us into more. And are we hungry for more of God? Are we hungry for more of the Father? Are we hungry for him to fill us and flood us to the point that our lives, they're far from boring. Our lives are filled with his spirit, filled with his promise, and filled with his presence. And so for me, I just want to throw these slides up there. These are four things that might be helpful to write down. And these are things that they're not just mine. There's a whole crew of us that are saying, this is what we're seeking after. We're going to seek his face. We're going to seek Jesus' face. Not his hands, not his miracles, not the things that he can provide. We're going to seek his face. Our Father in heaven who knit us in our mother's womb. We're going to seek him. Maybe it's early in the morning like Jesus, or maybe it's late at night, or maybe it's in, at noontime. We just crawl underneath our work desk and just pray and lay out before the Father. But we seek his face. And then we behold his glory. We don't come to the Father and say, thanks for the transaction, we'll see you later. We behold who he is, the creator of the universe, the author of life, the inspiration behind the movement that is the church and Christianity as we know it. We're gonna behold his glory. And this is the hard part. We're gonna repent. We're gonna repent of sin. Because so many times we think it's, sin is this big root stock that's in our lives and we got to start lopping off the branches and try to get back to the root. There's sin popping up in your and I's life every single day. And sometimes we get apathetic to it. We embrace it. We might coddle it and say, wow, that's just my thorn in my flesh. i got to carry it. Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. I want to return you to a place where my power and my potency returns to my church. Repent of sin whatever it is. And guess what? Repentance is the greatest gift that leads to freedom that we get to walk in, that we walk in 
freedom. No longer wearing the shame and the weight of our sin over us. The Father says, you are forgiven and with you I am well pleased. We walk in freedom. It's not just me. There's a picture here that they're going to throw up. That right there is in Graham Strondack's dining room. And what does it say? You guys can read it. Seek his face, behold his glory, repent of sin, and walk in freedom. There's a whole group of us that are saying, God, we want you to meet us in this place in a deeper way. We want our lives to be transformed and everybody here's lives to be transformed so that the church might be the light on the hill and the salt of the earth again today in 2023. And I believe it with every ounce in my body that he's gonna do it. And yet, I'm just gonna seek his face and behold who he is as my father and work the things out of my life that he doesn't want there and just walk in freedom. And so let me ask, is Christianity boring? Maybe, but following Jesus is far from boring. Because he not only paid a way for us through the cross and the resurrection, he invites us into a new way that leads to life. If you've ever thought about it, if Jesus put himself up on that cross as the sacrificial payment for our sin, would that have not been good enough? That Jesus' grace poured out by taking our place because we were children of wrath. We deserve the punishment, our pride, our guilt, our control, our greed. Somebody had to pay for it, and Jesus did. And is that not enough? And yet in his grace, he said, you've seen nothing yet. You want to see something that's not boring? I'm going to raise from the dead. I'm going to leave that tomb empty, and I'm going to meet you in the upper room, and I'm going to pour out my spirit upon you, and you're going to go into all of the ends of the earth with my gospel and good news. And it has transformed the world in 2023 years. His ministry has led us to this point that on this day, we can say, Father, we're hungry for more, and would you please give it? But we recognize that the power comes from laying our lives down as Jesus did himself. We take the bread, recognizing it was his body broken on our behalf. So we take and eat. And it was his cup poured out for the forgiveness of sin as his spirit would pour out on us that we enter into a new covenant where he says, with him and with her, I am well pleased. We drink the cup together. Father, thank you. Thank you is not even enough that we stand here at the beginning of the year with 365 days ahead of us. And may we take all of the resolutions that we have and we hold them with open hands because ultimately you're saying just lay your life down and I'll give you purpose and life that you've never dreamt possible. And it comes when we're willing to surrender. So Father, would you just come in here with your presence? Would you enter this place in ways that are so tangible that we recognize that you are here in this room with us, that your love pours out on every heart and mind in this place. And if there's only one thing that we take away, Father, may it be your voice in our minds and our hearts saying, with you I'm well pleased. Enter through the narrow gate. It leads to life. So Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the gospel. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for him being the king that is worthy of praise. The king that we desire to worship. And the shepherd of our souls. We thank you and we ask that you receive our worship here in this moment. As just a bit of what we can offer back to you. In Jesus' name, amen.